Residents of the quiet rural village of Holcomb in western Kansas awoke on November 15th, 1959 to the most terrifying and heart-wrenching news they had ever heard. Four members of the Clutter family, their neighbors, had been viciously slain in a random and completely unprovoked attack. Though two men would soon be found responsible for the heinous crime, the village of Holcomb would never be the same again. Taking care of your health is often a priority at the start of a new year, but what about your mental health? Therapy can seem daunting at times, but it also gives you the tools that you need to deal with challenges in your daily life. Untreated mental health problems can get in the way of achieving your goals, and we'd like to help you start the year right, alongside BetterHelp, who this video is in paid partnership with. BetterHelp is available to anyone looking to start therapy, no matter where you are. Finding the right therapist can be tricky, and they may not even be available in your area. With BetterHelp, you're connected with a credentialized therapist who will give you helpful, unbiased advice. In most cases, you can get started with your therapist within 48 hours of completing the initial questionnaire about what your needs are. There's flexibility in your therapy too, you can schedule whenever you want, change to a new therapist if the first one doesn't feel like the right fit, and hold your sessions however you want, video call, phone call, or even text if that's what you prefer. People often make resolutions to hit the gym this time of year, so why not hone your mind muscles too? Join over 4 million people who've used BetterHelp to start living a healthier, happier life by using the link in the description or by going to betterhelp.com slash coldcasedetective. You'll be supporting the channel and you'll get 10% off your first month so you can try it out and see if therapy helps you too. And now let's dive in with today's mysteries. Richard Hickok was born on June 6, 1931, in Kansas City, Kansas, though his family relocated to the town of Edgerton in 1947. In high school, Hickok was described as a popular student and a star athlete. He did well enough in school and dreamt of attending university one day, but his parents dampened these plans when they revealed they couldn't afford to send him. As a result, Hickok began working as a mechanic. In 1950, Hickok changed when he suffered a serious car accident which left him disfigured. He was described from this point on as having a slightly lopsided face and asymmetrical eyes. His brother recalled that the accident almost killed him and noted that it wasn't just his physical appearance that changed following the crash. Left with hefty hospital bills, Hickok began writing bad checks and gambling, unable to crawl out from under the debt that was piling up on top of him. He subsequently became a drifter, picking up manual labor jobs here and there as he continued to commit petty crimes, including theft. Aged 26 in March of 1958, he was apprehended and sentenced to prison for stealing a rifle. It was here in Kansas State Penitentiary that Hickok met Perry Smith. Perry Smith was born on October 27, 1928 in Huntington, Nevada. While Hickok's upbringing was described as stable but strict, Smith was brought up in an abusive household. In 1929, the family moved to Alaska and his father began selling bootleg whiskey to make ends meet. He was a known abuser who violently attacked his wife and their four children on a regular basis. It wasn't until 1935 that Smith's mother managed to find the courage to leave, taking her children with her. The family relocated to San Francisco, California. Unfortunately, however, things didn't improve for Smith and his siblings. Their mother soon became an alcoholic and eventually died in 1941 when Smith was just 13. 
He and his siblings were placed in a Catholic orphanage where Smith was reportedly beaten and emotionally abused by the nuns who ran the establishment. He was later placed in a Salvation Army orphanage, but it was no better as a caretaker allegedly tried to drown Smith. Eventually, he was able to reunite with his father and they spent the next few years of their lives together drifting between states. Smith soon became part of a street gang and began participating in petty crime. This landed him several stays in juvenile detention units. At age 16, he joined the military and served in the Korean War. He was given an honorable discharge in 1952. Following this, like Hickok, Smith found himself in an accident that almost killed him when he crashed his motorbike. His legs took the brunt of his severe injuries, and he suffered from chronic pain for the remainder of his life, often relying on heavy amounts of painkillers to help him manage the symptoms. In 1956, he was sentenced to five to 10 years in prison for burglary and unlawful flight to avoid prosecution after committing a robbery in Phillipsburg and escaping from jail. He spent over a year on the run before he was captured in New York City and imprisoned at the Kansas State Penitentiary. While in prison, Hickok and Smith encountered Floyd Wells. Wells was a former employee of the Clutter family. He told the other men about the family's wealth, claiming that the patriarch, Herbert, kept a safe in the house which contained $10,000. Hickok and Smith subsequently formed a plan which involved them robbing the home upon their release to help pay off their never-ending debts. Hickok was released in August 1959. At first, he tried to live his life on the straight and narrow. He got a job as a mechanic and secured local accommodation. But before long, he reached out to Smith, who'd been released in June that year. Hickok penned a letter to the former inmate, asking him to violate his parole by coming to Kansas and helping him commit the robbery they'd planned in prison. Though Smith did return to Kansas, he reportedly did so, intending to meet up with another former inmate whom he'd been especially close to in prison. It turned out, though, that this inmate had already left the state by the time Smith arrived. On the evening of November 14th, 1959, the two men drove over 400 miles to the rural village of Holcomb, where the Clutter family lived. At the time of the attacks, Herbert Clutter was 48 years old. As a young man, he had attended Kansas State University, majoring in agriculture, and in 1959, he was seen as a pillar of the community. He had headed the building committee for the recently built First Methodist Church in nearby Garden City. He was chairman of the board of the Garden City Co-op Equity Exchange, and he had once been a member of the Federal Farm Credit Board. He was widely recognized by locals and seen as a strong and generous man who always made time for members of his community. Herbert had met his wife Bonnie when still attending university. She was the sister of a classmate and was three years younger than him. Over the years, Bonnie has been falsely painted as a woman suffocating under the weight of depression, having been left with several physical ailments after the birth of their four children. However, surviving Clutter family members note that Bonnie was not, in fact, ill or unhappy. Like her husband, she was an important member of the community, involved with the local garden club and a regular churchgoer. She was often found helping to plan local events and enjoyed giving her time to others. Though she did suffer some mild pain issues, they were not anywhere near as severe as some sources made out to be. The most notable of which was the 1966 book In Cold Blood, which documented the Clutter family murders. Although the book was met with much success and is seen as pioneering work in the true crime genre, it has been heavily criticized for its focus on the killers and the brutality of their crimes rather than the victims. The Clutter family in particular were unimpressed with the portrayal of their relatives. Over the course of their marriage, Bonnie and Herbert had four children. Ivana was the eldest. At the time of the 1959 attack, she was married with a nine-month-old baby residing in Illinois. The second oldest, Beverly, was in Kansas City, studying to become a nurse. She was engaged and expected to wed the following year. The last two children, 16-year-old Nancy and 15-year-old Kenyon, the couple's only son, were still attending high school and were residing with their parents. 
Nancy was described as a fantastic student and a member of the school band in which she played clarinet. Outgoing and popular, she attended church regularly and had various hobbies, including horse riding, baking, and sewing. Kenyon, meanwhile, was described as quiet and introverted and enjoyed hunting, woodworking, and mechanical engineering. Hickok and Smith arrived at the Clutter family residence in the early hours of November 15th, entering the property through an unlocked door while the family slept. Inside, the two men woke the residents and forced Bonnie, Nancy, and Kenyon into a bathroom before leading Herbert downstairs to the ground floor, where they began searching for the safe. However, they were unable to locate it. Frustrated at how things were going, Hickok and Smith went back to the upstairs bathroom and began pulling out the other family members. Bonnie's hands were tied in front of her and her ankles were bound. She was gagged and placed in the bed in the first floor guest room. Nancy was also bound, though with her hands behind her. Sources differ as to whether she was gagged or not. Both the 1966 novel In Cold Blood and an article from the Garden City Police Department noted that she was not. Other news articles state that she was. Nancy was then placed in her bed. Kenyon and Herbert, meanwhile, were taken to the basement. Kenyon was gagged, his hands tied behind him. The remaining rope was knotted to an overhead steam pipe so he couldn't escape, but Smith and Hickok then changed their minds. They decided to cut the rope and move Kenyon into the playroom next door. Still bound and gagged, he was put on the small sofa in this room. Returning to Herbert, the two men bound and gagged him before pushing him down onto a mattress or a mattress box lying on the floor of the basement furnace room. Smith remained behind while Hickok went to try and locate the safe once more. Soon, Hickok realized there was no safe. There was no $10,000 that was going to turn his life around. Angry, he returned to the basement. The two men had reportedly already planned to leave no witnesses, and they discussed what to do next. Before reaching an agreement, however, Smith slit Herbert's throat before shooting him in the head. Smith is described as being unstable and prone to fits of rage. He subsequently went through to the playroom and shot Kenyon dead. Up on the first floor, the two men killed Nancy by shooting her in the head with their shotgun. Smith later claimed that he'd dissuaded Hickok from sexually assaulting the 16-year-old. Bonnie was the last to be killed by a gunshot wound to the side of her head. Every spent shell was collected by the men before they left the property. By the time of their departure, the two men had killed four members of a family and left with next to nothing. They had stolen a pair of binoculars, a portable radio, and $50 in cash, the equivalent of around $527 today. Later, on the morning of November 15th, school teacher Larry Hendricks, who'd recently moved to Holcomb from Garden City with his wife and four children, was approached by his downstairs neighbor. The neighbor explained that his daughter had passed the Clutter residence earlier that morning and had seen a body through the window. While the neighbor had called the sheriff's office, he requested that Larry check out the scene while they waited for law enforcement to arrive. Larry would later recall, I knew something was wrong as soon as we turned into their driveway. The first thing he noticed was that the family dog was sitting by the driveway looking different from its usual happy self. Upon approaching the canine, it ran off back to the house. While Larry saw no bodies on the ground floor, he noted that the front curtain was sagging and the curtain cords were missing. He checked upstairs first, where he found Nancy in her room. She had been bound using the missing curtain cords. Around this time, downstairs, the sheriff's deputies had arrived, and with Larry, they continued to cautiously explore the house, looking for more victims and clues. Bonnie Clutter was soon found in the guest room down the hall. The rest of the upper floor was clear, so Larry and law enforcement headed back downstairs, then down again into the basement. On the stairs, they noted bloody footprints and a bloody handprint on the railing. In the playroom of the basement, they found Kenyon. In the furnace room was Herbert. Larry recalled that he and the deputies were so taken aback by the scene that they could hardly talk, adding, no shotgun shells were found and they had no clue who the people were. The town of Holcomb was in shock. Holcomb became drastically different while the police searched for the perpetrators of this vicious crime. 
people no longer left doors unlocked and welcomed strangers in town. Instead, they became cut off from one another, declining to visit other homes. Those who approached houses at night adopted a new routine. They'd knock, step back to the edge of the porch, and wait. If they didn't know the occupants, they may have found themselves face to face with the barrel of a shotgun. Larry noted, quote, Everyone wondered who did it, and if they were coming back. Following the funeral, he moved his family to Alaska, despite liking and hoping to spend the rest of his life in Holcomb. The murders left him shaken and fearful. The Clutter family funeral was held on November 19th at the First Methodist Church in Garden City. Around 1,000 people attended, and many of these people went on to attend the burial at Valley View Cemetery. Investigators did not take the murder of four family members lightly. Their examination of the crime scene and the evidence was extremely thorough. The lead detective on the case was Alvin Dewey of the KBI, the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, who worked in conjunction with the Garden City Police Department. Garden City Police Assistant Chief Richard Rolader had experience in photography and was tasked with documenting the scene as it was. His photographs led to the discovery of a bloody footprint left behind at the scene, later identified as belonging to Perry Smith, and a tire track outside the home. Meanwhile, Hickok and Smith fled the Kansas City area. Hickok subsequently began writing bad checks, and eventually the pair fled to Mexico, where they spent a brief period of time pawning the stolen binoculars belonging to Herbert Clutter before returning to the US and hitchhiking to Nebraska. Shortly thereafter, they moved on to Iowa, where they hijacked a vehicle and drove back to Kansas City. From here, they moved on to Florida and then Nevada. Hickok and Smith were apprehended in Las Vegas on December 30th, around six weeks after the Clutter family murders. They were subsequently extradited to Kansas and put on trial in Garden City. Both men were found guilty of four counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to death on March 29, 1960. Hickok and Smith both confessed to their crimes. Though their legal counsel attempted to fight the death penalty, arguing that the two men had faced a prejudiced jury and prejudicial publicity before the trial, it ultimately came to nothing. On April 14th, 1965, both Hickok and Smith were hanged at Kansas State Prison. Fifty years after their deaths, their bodies were exhumed. The pair were considered suspects in a December 1959 cold case, where Cliff and Christine Walker, along with their two children, were shot dead in Osprey, Florida. Authorities believed Hickok and Smith had been just a few miles from the crime scene while still on the run after the Clutter murders. Though at the time a polygraph cleared them of involvement with the Walker family murders, by modern polygraph standards their test results were deemed invalid, and as we all know, Polygraphs are unreliable. In 2012, the bodies were exhumed to compare to DNA evidence found at the scene of the Walker murders. In August 2013, however, it was announced there was no concrete connection between Smith and Hickok and the Walker case. While the Kansas Bureau of Investigation lab had taken partial DNA from their femurs and teeth, testing revealed that there had been contamination at the lab, with Perry Smith's tooth returning the DNA of a woman, that of the examiner who had looked at his bones. His femur turned up another female profile, this one unknown. Partial DNA was retrieved from both men, but neither profile matched that of the DNA from the December 1959 crime scene. In a later report, it emerged that the DNA of the suspect was noticeably similar to that of one of the victims, Christine Walker, which led investigators to realize that for decades they had been comparing DNA not to their suspect, but to Christine. While Hickok and Smith remained the most likely suspects in the case, law enforcement added, DNA testing seems unlikely to provide conclusive evidence one way or the other. Hickok, Smith, and the Clutter family murders have been the subject of numerous films, books, and songs over the years, the most notable of which is the one mentioned earlier, In Cold Blood, published seven years after the murders. Despite winning several awards and receiving much critical acclaim, the book was criticized by many, including remaining Clutter family members. 
In 2018, a docu-series named Cold-Blooded, The Clutter Family Murders was released. Documentarian Joe Berlinger, the man behind the series, noted that he was interested in changing the popular framing of the crime. He sought to give a platform to the family, who he felt had been brushed aside in the past. For decades, the Clutter family had remained silent following the murders, but took the opportunity in 2018 to set the record straight once and for all. The novel, In Cold Blood, focuses extensively on the backgrounds of Hickok and Smith, as well as their version of what happened at the residence on the day of the murders. The two men are often noted to go into gruesome detail about the killings. Furthermore, the author never reached out to the Clutter family after they raised concerns with him, he reportedly stopped engaging with them once his book was published. The Clutter family felt the book glorified the murders and mischaracterized their deceased loved ones, and also noted that the author had been allowed to walk around the family home where the murders had occurred, with one Clutter niece labeling this as a violation. The novel has also been criticized for appearing to have fabricated several scenes along with dialogue. Some even argued that facts were altered to fit the novel's narrative. In the aftermath of the tragedy, the Clutter family took solace in one another and their faith, firmly believing they would one day see Herbert, Bonnie, Nancy, and Kenyon again. One of Herbert and Bonnie's granddaughters told People.com, what happened caused us to focus even more on the strength and support of the family and help one another. There is a very strong bond of care and love between our family members. She added that the family continue to keep clutter traditions alive, noting, One of the letters that we have is from Grandma Bonnie, who wrote to her mother after Christmas, especially about the traditions of Christmas Eve, which we've kept and passed down and keeps going even today. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions. And remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.